Praise God this evening. Let's come together. This is another Friday Bible study. And I know that the Lord has a, a word for each and every one of us. And we're going to enter into his presence as we're gathered here in his name. We're going to lift up another in the fire. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. And that's the promise that he has given us. Lo, I will be with you even unto the end of the age. It says, there was another in the fire standing next to me. There's another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there's a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. So let, as we sing these words, let's, let them be a reality. We remember Mishat, Shadrach and Abednego where they were in the fiery furnace of affliction. And sometimes we sing or we read these narratives as though they are mere fables. They are a reality. They're literal history as well as spiritual significance. It actually happened. There's evidence and witnesses. There was another in the fire. When they were in that fiery fire of affliction, the Lord stepped in and was with them. So whatever we go through, we need to remember and actually borrow faith of those that have gone before. So if you feel weak in any way this evening, or lost, or in despair, know that there's another that is with you that said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. So let's prepare our hearts. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather in this way. I'm so grateful for my church, my brothers and my sisters, for our overseer, Lord. I thank you, Almighty God, that tonight you have prepared a word in due season. And so soften our hearts once again as we take this opportunity to draw near as the woman who pushed through the crowd, Lord, and touched the hem of your garment. We know that you are here present with us, not just the hem of your garment, but we can touch you, Lord, that you may feel virtue leave heaven tonight. Forgetting what lies behind, we press on in. There's another in the fire. I thank you, God, that some trust in horses and chariots, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. And that touching you is all that matters. Lord, we thank you because you live, we live also. Unite us together in worship. In worship. To hear the Shema in the depth of our soul. To know that you are our God. That there is only one true and living God. And your name is Jesus Christ. And we bow the knee of our heart to you this evening, Lord. Holy Spirit, we invite you. We invite you in this presence, in this gathering, as we are still and know that you are God. We thank you for your awesomeness, your majesty, your splendor, your goodness and your mercy that follow us all the days of our lives. That you have not left us orphans, but that you have given us your Holy Spirit to live and to abide and to guide us into all truth and into all righteousness. As we seek you first tonight, that the cares of this world will grow strangely dim. Some may trust in horses and chariots, but I know that as for me, my church will trust in the name of the Lord. We remember David, a young shepherd boy, who took five shiny stones from the brook and went against the mighty Goliath. I thank you, God, that if we just believe, nothing is impossible. We believe, Lord, help our unbelief. I thank you that you've blessed us from the crown of our head to the soles of our feet. And tonight we give you the preeminence and the glory in Jesus' name. There's a grace.
There was another in the fire Standing next to me Standing next to me There's another in the waters Holding back the seas Should I ever need reminding Of how I've been set free There's a cross to face the third
This is where our power comes from. This is why we have great confidence and we can be assured that he's with us. It says, then David said to the Philistine, you come with me with a sword, with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. And that's the confidence we have that some trust in horses and chariots but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. So no matter what Goliath comes before you or mountain, be assured that he's with us, that we don't have anything to fear that we can truly entrust our lives to him. We sing this song and it's one of our favorite at the moment. Be still and know that you are God. And it says, as the world around us crumbles and the chaos grows, be still. And we need to take that authority over the thoughts of our minds. Forget having an army outside ourselves. The fiercest army is within ourselves. And I said on Sunday, the, the quote that says, yesterday I was clever and sought to change the world. Today I am wise and I'm seeking to change myself. Forget what everyone else is doing or thinking or experiencing. Be your brother and sister's keeper and be on your knees if you're thinking of them, but not about their lives. Look to within us because the Holy Spirit is within you, within me, and he's the one. It's his role and his job to lead us and guide us into all righteousness. But we need to be co-workers as we've been ministered from this pulpit. And tonight as the word goes out, I encourage you, or those of you at home, church is a gathering of believers. Spurgeon actually said years ago, in the 1800s I think, sure how when he was but he actually said there's going to come a time where instead of shepherds being on the pulpit feeding the flock there'll be clowns entertaining there'll be there'll be there'll be clowns I forgot how he said instead of shepherds being on the pulpit feeding the flock there'll be there'll be clowns entertaining the goats instead of Shepherds being on the pulpit, feeding the sheep, there'll be clowns entertaining the goats. Now we are a privileged people in this ministry because we know that our minister, our overseer, doesn't entertain us. He feeds us like Jesus fed those. And so we need to take responsibility on a Friday night Bible study to come with an attitude to receive, to come hungry before the things of God. Because when there's, there's a saying that says that the fountain of God is open to those who are athirst, we can either allow the word to be ek, to go forth and execute what God sent it to do, and there'll be a liberty in the spirit, there'll be a freedom in the atmosphere where the word can minister, can change our lives, can have an effect. Or we can put barriers up, blockages up, and we can stop that word from going forth. So we need one another this evening. Create an atmosphere, church, where the Holy Spirit can minister. Sometimes when we come to worship, 
There's a closeness in the spiritual realm because we all are our brother and sister's keeper and we need to make a decision. When they were in the upper room and they were praying and the Holy Spirit descended upon them and sat upon them, they, had, they were in one spirit, it says, in one accord. They were united in their vision, in their seeking of God. And that's what we need to do. When we come together, especially on a Friday night, we're the inner core. We need to be hungry for the word. So please, allow the Holy Spirit now as we take our offering to have space in this place, to give him time, to do something new in our lives. Just be. Everything else can wait. I've come to seek your face. So everything else can wait. I'm here for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this is why we have come to seek the true and living God. Lord, we desire a word from you. We hunger and we thirst for righteousness. And I pray, Almighty God, that tonight will be the beginning of beginnings, will be a new day for each and every one of us. I pray for our families, Lord, for the prayer requests that have come in today, Lord. Father, you know each and every one, but I do pray for that nine-year-old young girl, Lord. I pray, Father, against this cancer once again, Lord. I pray, Father God, that your hand may be upon her. And for the other young girl that we heard of this week with leukemia, Lord, there is nothing impossible with you. You are the great physician, and we've seen answered prayer. When we unite our hearts together and lift, we have seen you move, Lord. And so we lift these two young girls up to your throne tonight, Lord. Have your way. Touch them. Send your word and heal that disease, Lord. We pray, Father God, as we take our offering now, Lord, that you will meet the many needs, Lord. And for the word that will be ministered, soften my heart. Do something new within us, Lord. Let's have him preach to others. We will be disqualified. But we know you as our advocate. We have known you as faithful. We have known you as a friend. And Lord, we come before you with sincerity tonight as one church, as one body, that we'll have no spot nor wrinkle, that you truly are preparing your bride. From the crown of our head to the soles of our feet, Lord, we are here for you tonight. We give you the space, the time. We say, yes, Lord, as for me and my church, we will serve you. In Jesus' name we pray.
for the offering, for the word that will be ministered this evening, for every aspect of this church in Jesus' name, as we invite Archbishop to share with us this evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? This is a new equipment, new technology tonight. God bless. But can you hear me clearly? I haven't even tested it. I've been so busy. I've been away the past few days and I haven't had time to come and do the test run. But it's a new system transmitted on the social media and hopefully we're going out uh, in the next few weeks. We're seeing about the, one of the Sky channels to actually air so we can have an international reinforce the message and the love of God at this time such as this. So God bless. It's good to see you. It's light, sunny. You see there's a change, there's a shift in the building, isn't there? The, look at the sound. We've got our technicians at the back there. <laughs> Amen. There's about five cameras. And we're going to put an announcement actually at the front door that anyone who doesn't want to be filmed and shown on television, just let us know. There's a little blind spot. They're going to, we're going to put them in. But if, you all, but if you all decide not to be aired on television, then no one's going to be seen. <laughs> They're just going to have to do with me. So God bless you. It's exciting times. Things, you know, when you see um, progression, a type of spiritual evolution, it's exciting. Because you know God is in the house. The world has changed. But even though there's negativity, there's some positive things that have come out. Amazing things have come out of these times such as this. It showed people rise above the everyday mundane things and do special things. You know, in the, in the National Health Service, the emergency services, people, neighbours being their brother and sister's keeper, being their neighbor's keeper, and things like this. It's brought something good. There's been negativity as well. We're not going to be, you know, blinded about this. We're going to be realistic about it, not just idealistic. There are some evils around the world, as we're seeing us also at the same time. But I, I like, as we shared last Sunday, when we saw those two brothers, there's some good in the world, and it gives us hope and encourages us that there is goodness in the world. Praise God. There are good people around. And in fact, you are the good people. Amen. Amen. Is that right? That's why we're here this evening. Praise the Lord. Amen. So God bless you. And we're just going to keep uh, each other in prayer. As Penny shared, can we not mess around with my sound? Did someone, did someone do anything there? It just went up and down. Did anyone touch the... Yeah, don't touch. Thank you. I'm fine here. <laughs> I'm very sensitive when, it, when I'm standing. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. You okay back here? Yes. I speak and I don't acknowledge the people back here. Well done. Praise God. I know people are still making their way. Amen. Tomorrow is uh, Prince Philip's funeral service as well. We want to be mindful of Her Majesty the Queen. We want to pray for the royal family. You know, like we're all human. And everyone has emotions. And when you lose someone that's been with you for over 70 or 73 or so years, it's a great loss. And it's a void that's very difficult to fill. It doesn't matter if you're a king or a pauper. It doesn't matter the position in life. Loss is loss. There's a connection there that's been broken. We just want to pray that as he goes over to be the Lord, as I showed last week, the video clip that um, he had his own personal faith in the Lord. He was a believer. And so forth. So we just want to just lift up the royal family in prayer as well tonight as before we come to the message as preparation for tomorrow's funeral. Anyone else who's lost a loved one, we want to pray for you. In fact, this week I also, in my busy schedule, spinning plates, I also officiated a funeral service, the one I mentioned last week. Kiri came with me. We, we uh, uh, officiated that funeral service, a lady 62 years old. So let's just bow our heads and we're just going to pray for the royal family, for the country, for the world. Father, we just lift up the royal family, the royal household, Her Majesty the Queen, and all the royal family, Prince Charles, and all the, all the members of the family. We commit them to your throne now, and we ask for comfort, console them, Lord, encourage them, Lord, and give them comfort at a time such as this. We pray for any other person who has lost a loved one. We pray that you comfort them, and especially the funeral services. We comfort the family as well, Lord. But it, we know it's not final. It's just a parenthesis to something greater. It's a comma, not a full stop. It's not goodbye. It's until we meet again. We give you the praise, the glory, and the worship, Lord. As we say in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Tonight's message, the theme of tonight's message is 
faith. Amen, faith. Uh, we exercise faith on a daily basis. You travelled here by faith. If you travelled on London transport, any type of transport, you had faith. There's a bit of an echo here. We haven't tested this, but it's vibrating. Can we try and change the echo, please? Amen. We, you exercise faith. You trust. Who do you trust? The driver of the bus. The driver of the train. You trust. You take it for granted that that person is qualified to take you from A to B. Is that right? You don't know the person. You don't know their background. But you just get on board the train believing that he's gone through due scrutiny and been qualified to, travel, to drive that vehicle. When you board an aeroplane, you don't ask to see the pilot's diploma. Do you? You just get on an aeroplane. Some of you fearful. I often get calls from people from the airports. Who's anyone here ever called me from an airport? I can see someone who has. Bishop, pray, pray for me. I'm just going to get up. Don't worry, you're going to get to your destination. If it was not so, God would have told me. I would have called you. I would have said, don't get on the plane. <laughs> but you trust. We exercise this. But when God asks us to trust him, we want guarantees. We want reassurances. We don't want to, we want, we want, we want clarity. We want confirmation. But yet every day we do things that, that brings about that has us operating faith on different levels. When you go to your doctor, you don't ask your doctor to show you the, your, his qualifications. He scribbles something down on a piece of paper and you trust him and you go and you take the medication, whatever it is. You don't even know what's in the medication. And it's quite, quite amuses me, really, because there's been so much hype around vaccines, yet when you go and get your prescription, you don't ever ask what's in that medicine. Hands up if you've ever gone to the doctor and asked him to break down whatever is in the medicine. We have one person there. <laughs> Two, three. On the whole, people do not know what they're taking. Back in the day when I used to visit my parents' house, my dad had a little bag with about 30 different medications. And one was for the original ailment. The others were for the side effects of that. I'm not exaggerating, blood pressure, cholesterol, you know, he had all these different things going on there. And, but trust, rather than do some exercise, take a pill. Diabetes, take a pill. High blood pressure, take a pill. All these things, but sometimes there's natural remedies that we can apply. But what the point is, what I'm saying is that often or not, more than not, people will go to a doctor, give you a piece of paper, but you never question that piece of paper. And if you do, it's explained to you, and you still go, nonetheless, not even knowing, and you may take the medication. We exercise, it requires faith to act on faith. We do this all the time, but yet with God, we question everything. Many, many people, some people don't, but some, many people question God. And having got faith in God changes everything because it changes your outlook in life. And I want to show you a few examples through the Word of God. Or how God looks at, because unbelief, or disbelief, it, it closes doors, spiritual doors. And even you need faith as a businessman in the world. You need to believe in what you're investing in for the particular outcome. I remember that one of the directors of Walt Disney was being interviewed by a television channel. And they were saying to this director of Walt Disney, wouldn't it be wonderful if Walt Disney was here to see how Walt Disney has developed and what it has become. And the director says, no, you're wrong, reporter. It's because Walt Disney saw this that you can see it. Requires faith. He believed in his product. Look, Kentucky Fried Chicken. The man was, I think, 60 years old, similar to my age, when he started Kentucky Fried Chicken. He went to about 50 banks, and no one believed in him. But he had faith in himself and in his product, and it's become finger-licking good. And there's so many stories along those lines that people don't give up on themselves. It's one thing for other people to give up on your belief, your vision. It's another thing when you give up yourself. 
If people don't believe in you, that's fine. That's their prerogative. But stop believing in yourself because other people don't believe in you. Just keep going until you succeed. And if one thing you may succeed, you may succeed learning the mistakes you have made on the journey and their lessons in themselves. So I want to take a, a, a journey through the Word of God to see about faith because faith is a, is a showstopper. Faith, uh, lack of faith, closes doors. Yeah? Doubt. Okay? And I want to look at different ways to look at the word faith. The Greek word faith is bisti, bistevo. And I want to look at how to look at this particular word, okay, and how to embrace it, embody it, and internalize this, this, this word faith. When the children of Israel left Egypt and they were in the wilderness, they were complaining. They didn't have the faith to see the outcome. Even though when the Lord sent them to spy out the land, he sent 12, one member from each family to spy the, the Canaan, the promised land, which was flowing with milk and honey. He had pomegranates, grapes, and some giant grapes. It took two men to carry them on a pole. And they came back because they saw giants. The giants were bigger than the promise of, I wish I'm speaking, than the promise of God. And they came back and gave a negative report. Ten of them gave her a negative report. Two of them gave a positive report. They said, we can take the land because God had already said, it's yours. And God is saying to you, ACC, today I have my promises. I've spoken to your life. They're yours. Take them, receive them, and act upon them, and move on and prosper with them. That's what God is saying. He's saying, my promises are yes and amen. But the key to activate those promises is faith. It's like the spark that starts the fire. The faith is the spark that starts the process to bring that particular outcome. We've got to start becoming a believing people. And when the children of Israel in the wilderness, because of their lack of faith and disbelief, they were wandering aimlessly in the wilderness for 40 years. It's a long time. And, and the people who gave the, the, the positive report had to wander with them for 40 years because of their short-sightedness. They were victims of people's disbeliefs. And so the, the thing is to disconnect with negativity and embrace positivity. In the same way when Jesus went to Jairus' house and entered the room and the girl, his daughter, was 12 years old who had died, there was all negativity around them. And Jesus said, take them all out of here because negativity and positivity cannot coexist. Faith and doubt cannot, doubt cannot coexist. You need to get all the faith, get rid of, sift out all the faith and just doubt and let faith just grow and develop, and you see, a dev you see a positive outcome. And as they were moving through the wilderness, God promised them the promised land. But they kept on giving negative reports. They kept on complaining all the time on the journey. They were never satisfied. And they came to times and places. They forgot the miracles in Egypt. They forgot the plagues in Egypt. Can you imagine you being taken out of a prison, a situation, and taken on a journey, and coming to a dead end, which is the Sea of Reeds, the, 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 the Red Sea, and there's no way forward, and God instructs Moses to stretch out the rod and his hand up, face towards the heaven, and the sea parts? What would you do if you saw such a miracle? Be amazed. You'll be, you'll be transformed forever. You can never go back. You can never doubt again if you saw that miracle. The God that brought you out couldn't part the sea. What more can he do in your life? But yeah, they came to a time when there was no water. They were in the desert and they had no water to drink. And instead of remembering the miracles, recounting the miracles and blessings of God, they started to complain against God, against Moses, to the point where Moses was afraid that they were going to stone him. What, what an... An, they are, unappreciated, they didn't appreciate what God did for them. There's no difference to many people today. God can give you the world. We're not satisfied. And they come to a point in Exodus chapter 17, verse 1. We'll read a few of these verses. And I want to see uh, Exodus 17, verse 1 says this. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord and camped in Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Jesus gives the water that you never thirst. You know, he met, them, he met the Samaritan woman. He said, if you ask me from me, I'll give you water that you never thirst again. But their thirst was something else. They were thirsting for other things. They were thirsting for self-gratification. 
They were, they were, they were thirsting for, 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 for themselves for, to succeed in their own identities. There's many things you can thirst for. Jesus says, blessed is he, blessed are those who, thirst, uh, for, for, who are hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. That's the thirst and hunger that we should. But they were hungry. Rephidim means rest, resting place. They came to a place to rest, to reflect, but they were complaining in that particular place. And by verse 3, and when you go home, please read the whole chapter yourself. By verse 3, we find that we read this. And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses, said, Why is it that you have brought us out, up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? God, when God does something in your life, it's for the, your betterment. It's not for your, for your distraction. It's for your betterment. But the key is to look to see through the eyes of the Spirit, to see the lesson we are learning in this particular situation. And by verse 6, this is what happens. Please follow through with me. This is what we're told in verse 6. It says, Behold, I will stand before you, you there on the rock of Horeb. Now God responds to Moses what he's about to do to, to satisfy the thirst of the people. This is, he instructs Moses what to do. And this is what he's told. He says this, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb. This is God speaking to Moses. And you should strike the rock, and water will come out of, of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did as in the, did so in the sight of the earth. Died so 